very badly. <laughs> okay, uh, how many computer science majors? How many non-computer science majors? How many people can use eigenvector in a sentence? All right, we're going to fix that. Um, how many people have been to Disney's Carousel of Progress? Wow. <laughs> so when I sing the song, there's a great big beautiful tomorrow, right? That's the theme song. Um, it is, are we clicking here? Um, Carousel of Progress is kind of a weird thing. It's, it's one of these exhibits that was originally at the World's Fair. If you saw the movie Tomorrowland, you saw little glimpses of it in there. Essentially, it's four views from the 20s, the 40s, the 60s, and in the future of the same family, basically in the same exact context. It's supposed to show the, the, how technology has improved our lives, how progress has made everything better. And interestingly enough, it's the same thing over and over. They're sitting around the dining room table, and the entertainment's different, and they're handheld games as opposed to listening to the radio, and the refrigerator works, and maybe there's a microwave, but nothing's fundamentally different. And that is certainly not the kind of progress that we are seeing now. Things are most definitely different. And there's a great book by Cory Doctorow, one of my all-time favorite authors, called The Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow. And Doctorow has this fascination with the Carousel of Progress, mostly because when he was a kid and would go to Disney World, <coughs> Disneyland, it was one of the rides you could go on over and over again without a ticket. It became one of his favorites. In this book, he thinks about a future where we have gene editing, we have immortality, we can do all sorts of wonderful things with nanotechnology. Is that really a bigger, better, more beautiful tomorrow? Or do we accidentally engineer ourselves into some uncomfortable things like, what happens when you're immortal and your body's still 11 years old when your brain is 30? It's really hard to get dates, <laughs> for one thing. Okay? So my question is, is healthcare beautiful? Think about it. Is going to the doctor an enjoyable experience? The healthcare is mostly done to you. So that's something, for the most part, you do willingly. One of the companies that we have in our uh, investment portfolio is called Wiser Together. And Wiser Together takes a different look at what the quality or the cost of healthcare would be. In particular, it's not just the how good a result you may have. Let's say you, look at, you have to have an operation on your knee. You have to have arthroscopic surgery on your knee. Should you have arthroscopic? Should you just go for physical therapy? Should you have a full open surgery done? Each of those comes with a different set of costs. How long you're out of work or out of school? how much pain you go through, how long it takes you to recover, how well you might be able to play your favorite sport afterwards. If you're a professional basketball player, that's one thing. If you're a weekend warrior like me, you know what? You generally don't need the full function you had before because you weren't that good to begin with no matter what you think. So the question becomes, how do we actually measure what good looks like there? And I will argue that as we get more and more data, as we become more and more centric about individuals, about precision medicine, about personalized medicine and personalized healthcare by extension, it's going to become much more data driven. We have an opportunity, I think, to make healthcare beautiful. We have to do a very, very good job thinking about what we're going to do with all the data, where it's going to come from, what we're going to do with it, in particular, how we're going to manage some of the larger challenges around it. And that's kind of where I, I want to start. But uh, before I dig into the healthcare aspects, I want to back up a little bit. People like to talk about disruption. It's one of the things that my group um, I heard Dr. Williams introduce says we, we do disruptive services. I believe that disruption comes in four flavors. Um, the first is that you fundamentally change the cost of doing something. So Kodak, everyone likes to say, oh, Kodak was killed by the digital camera. They weren't. Kodak invented the digital camera. I had a Kodak digital camera. It took pictures on a five and a quarter inch floppy disk. It just took about eight seconds to record it. Where co killed Kodak was their bet that you would never email those pictures that it would be faster for you to take whatever disk device you had that had your digital photographs on, drive to the corner drugstore, have them printed, put them in envelopes, and mail them to your grandma in California, then to email them. Because at the time they were thinking about that, the fastest mode you get was the one that's out there in the lobby. It's 14 kilobits per second. As soon as you happen to have high-speed networking that's ubiquitous, and better yet, attached to a camera, that was it. It wasn't the digital camera, it was the cost of networking, the cost of transmitting it. And we see this over and over again. When people bet against a major cost disruption, that's when industries completely get upturned, whether it was the US steel business or whether it was the digital photography business. Second thing you do is you go and match up supply and demand differently. So the great invention of Uber is that I believe you can actually see how long it's going to take you to get a cab, and they do a very, very good job of matching supply and demand of drivers and riders. The fact that they also let you rate each other and they, 
They allow, you know, make it very, very simple for you to see what the inventory is and where you're going. To me, it's all sort of superfluous. The, the, the major in, uh, innovation here is they created a market. Uh, what used to be a one-sided market, you'd stand on the corner and do this and get angry when someone cut in front of you. They created a two-sided market. They actually added a supply-side visibility into it. Google created disruption through scale. What better way to index the internet than copy it? Then you can add all the indices you want to it. Figure out what you want to do, what you want to overlay, how you want to bring different sources of information together. So you think about that initially, people say, you're going to copy the internet? The internet's huge. Nah, it's a couple hundred petabytes. Disk is cheap. Google knows how to do things at scale. You think about what they do, where Google truly adds advantages, they know how to scale at a remarkable, remarkable capacity. A lot of the tools they use can get through open source. But the things that really run the data center, how they deploy software, how they manage their servers, how they do reliability engineering, that's their secret sauce. <coughs> and that, again, it, it's really creating disruption through scale. And finally, you just provide better access to information. When Jeff Bezos had the idea for Amazon, his notion was there's this database of books in print. The only part of it you see is it's a very small aperture you get when you go to your local bookstore. You see the 10,000 titles they've chosen to show you. But there are millions of titles in print. And you can order all of them. Why not just put it all online? Essentially, Amazon was making a database available online. And then, again, once you realize, well, it's a database of books, you could also do that for toys and electronics and so on. You have Amazon as it is today. And then, again, you open it up to other people to go add their own catalogs of products, used products or, or unique products to it, and Amazon stores were, were, uh, were born. But the key thing here is that no matter what you think of, you think of how is this industry going to be disrupted, you start to look for what are the constraints in access, in scale, in cost, or in the ability to match buyers and sellers, your ability to match different parts of the market. And I will argue that in healthcare, we have every one of these problems. We don't understand scale very well. We don't know how to match supply and demand of data in particular. Because I'll tell you right now, you ever go to the doctor, you see that seven page HIPAA form, you sign away a limited number of rights and then you never see it again. What if later on, your data could be very interesting to someone doing a research project? or looking at building a cohort of patients to include in a clinical study. They have no way of getting in touch with you. They have no way of getting access to that data later on. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. <coughs> so let me, thinking about disruption, let's put that now in the phrase of big data. When we say big data, it's to me one of these favorite industry terms, like, oh, it's big data. Of course it's big, it's just petabytes of data. And it's data, because there's lots of it. And you know, look how much data, you'll always get a slide basically showing how much data we're creating. I'm, I won't bore you with that, we're creating a lot of data. Actually, I will bore you with it, but, but in, in a, hopefully a funnier context. So one way to think of this in terms of the, the world of big data is, well, we have to go store it all. Yes, we have to go store petabytes of data. And we want to be able to go compute on it. <coughs> the thing that makes big data interesting is how we organize it. That is, how do we take this, these enormous globs of data and turn them into something useful, something fungible, something that will allow us to make better decisions? And if you look at the intersections, let's say of organization and compute, it's doing things like pre-computing indices. Again, why is it that Google works the way it does? Well, because they pre-compute the page rank index of all the pages that they can find. The other thing you might do is, well, you might do a better job of, um, from a storage perspective of building uh, a set of indices or a set of, of, of views for better interactive uh, use of the data or for better querying of the data. It's very, very hard to go through petabytes of data looking for one or two records or trying to find relationships. So you may build a graph, and then you use the graph to, Im again, impose some structure on the data, figure out how various data sets are related to each other, how you might walk the graph, and again, add some organization on top of it. And one of the interesting discussions to get into a lot is the difference between content, that is, where are the bits, how are they stored on disk, how are they edited and, and created and published, and knowledge, which is really, how do you actually look at, at how those things relate to each other? How is it you go in to build the, the appropriate indices on top? You think about doing something as simple as planning a vacation, or planning a trip. Now, again, you can go and realize there are probably 10,000 or 20,000 websites you might have to look at. Oh, I could never look, there's too many places to look. Nonsense. Where do you go? Orbitz, Expedia, TripAdvisor, Yelp. And if you even use all four of those, I'd be surprised. Most people can do it in two. And then you get your airfare, your hotel, some restaurants, some ideas of things to do. Four sites have done all the organization of the tens of thousands of websites underneath. And it works until the next the most interesting one comes along. Or people decide they like TripAdvisor better than they like Yelp. Or that there has to be a local version of Yelp that provides much more local, better indexing or much more uh, local color on top of the data. So key point here is that it really, we have to think about how we're going to organize the big data 
one of the, the I would say the vectors toward the challenges is really understanding what, what sort of organization we want to impose and what are the risks of imposing that organization. So again, I promised that I'd use eigenvector in a sentence. I'll give you five eigenvectors I think that span the, the problem space of thinking about the challenges. First one is that most people don't speak in healthcare. They speak in vernacular. This turns out to be a really hard problem in things like natural language processing because differentiating I have a pain in my hip from my kids are a pain in my butt is fairly hard. The patient was seen on Tuesday. A mass was seen on an MRI. The patient has not been seen in the last three months. The patient has not seen any improvement in her symptoms despite treatment. Seen's a really difficult word in healthcare because it means so many different things depending upon the context. But we realize that most of the data we're going to get, most of the unstructured data we're going to get, that's not written by a medical professional is in vernacular. We have to be able to deal with that. Second thing is even with medical data, we have an opportunity to create an awful lot of metadata. Metadata is useful. Metadata is hugely wonderful. It's what, make, what makes Netflix tick. And again, thinking about what we want to create, what we want to impose, how we want to use that will be useful. Then we'll start taking a look at things that are, are real-time streams that are mostly imprecise. How many people have fitness trackers, Fitbit, Withings, okay? Um, if you ever are a true nerd, you have two of them, track them side by side, you realize they don't record steps the same way, or calories the same way, or sleep the same way. They are notoriously poor um, data quality. They mostly are directionally correct. Uh, what I noticed with, uh, I, have, I have a withings, what I noticed is that um, it, because um, ice skating doesn't involve you know, planting motion, it's mostly gliding motion, I get zero credit for, for ice skating, which again, according to my wife, I probably shouldn't get credit for it anyway, but uh, digression. <coughs> I want to think about what do we do with all this real-time data. Fourth thing is, I'll pull those together, we are facing an enormous set of risks around privacy. Um, matter of fact, there's a, uh, an interesting set of cases now. The default setting on um, Fitbit was when you created a profile, it made all your data public, it was really cool. Hey, come look at all my data, you can see how, you know, how well I'm doing you know, with my steps and my running programs. It turns out that if you happen to wear your Fitbit all the time, it also tracks things you do at like 1 a.m. and you know, fill in the blanks, okay? A lot of data that people did not want published was published. Um, finally, I wanna talk a little bit about how we, how we drive cultural change. And I think a lot of this is gonna be about thinking through what we wanna go do with our data, what we consider personal, to what extent we want it distributed or diffused, and what we want done with the data. So I'll back up a little bit. Set top box, 1995. That was the center of the home universe. If you controlled the set-top box, you controlled what people watched in their home. Okay, what do you, how many people care about the set-top box today? How many, how many of you have set-top boxes in, in dorm rooms? How many have cable in the dorm room? Netflix, Hulu, iTunes. Okay, set-top boxes, who cares? But very, very interesting. 20 years ago, that was the thing you optimized for. That's what Java was invented for. Java was invented to be the language for programming set-top boxes so we could do secure content delivery into the home. And if you go back and read all of James Gosling's you know, papers on, on um, Star 9 and the Green Project, it was meant to drive set-top boxes. But what happened is we put the consumer in the middle of it. And as soon as the consumer could choose what you wanted to watch, where you wanted to watch it, when you wanted to watch it, suddenly this thing at the end of the cable in your home was not that interesting. Instead, it was what content we're going to deliver to what channel. And we are seeing the same thing happen right now with healthcare. I believe that Apple's introduction of HealthKit and ResearchKit puts the consumer in the center of thinking about healthcare data. And it is just as important a shift, I believe, as iTunes, which put the consumer in the center of thinking about what movies and, and music you are going to go consume. Give you choice, allow you to consume things on a fine grain, figure out what you want to share with whom. We are at that tipping point right now, which again, it means it's a very, very cool time to think about devices that generate data, sensors that generate data, and the big data services that consume them, and again, try to create value out of them. So the first issue with vernacular is that <coughs> people's language changes depending upon what just happened to them. So you start off, and this is called the, 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 the peak end rule, which is basically your memory of something very much depends upon your last interaction with it. This is why you always think the vacation is great, even if it rained the whole time, because your memory of the vacation is very, very good. And so again, why most people have a very negative view of healthcare is because 
Either you were sick or someone you know was sick or something bad happened to someone you know, and that's how you interact with the healthcare system. It's generally event-driven and usually not such great events. Exception to things like, like having kids. Those are the exceptions. You think about this, you sort of go through this path where your positive or negative reaction to healthcare kind of varies up and down. There's a fairly high dynamic range. You're healthy, you're young, something bad happens. A friend of yours has an accident. Or you, know, you, you discover you have a, a disease, you have a metabolic issue. And then you sort of, you know, okay, you figure out how to deal with it, you start to be positive, you see results, it's great. Then again, something bad happens, you sort of oscillate back and forth. So the first thing I have to worry about is just, again, what's the context or what's the framework by which people are dis actually describing their health care? The second thing is that a lot of times we're picking up much more precise data but it's, it's in, in many cases, wrapped up in, in, in other layers of being. So this is um, my family um, in 1910 Kiev, right before they came to the United States. Half of them came to the US, half of them didn't. Um, that's my family history. I know nothing before that picture. I basically know that, that my great-grandmother was born in Lvov in what's now Poland, Lemberg, in about 1860. There's zero family history for that. I don't know where we are from. Therefore, I don't know genetically what diseases we're susceptible to, what things are possibly, again, related to geography or related to family heritage, because we simply don't have the records. Now, I can go to 23andMe, I can go to Ancestry.com and try to figure out where the family name came from, if there are other records. For the most part, this doesn't exist. More recently, I would like to know what the long-term effects are of drinking two Dunkin' Donuts large iced coffees every morning while listening to Animals as Leaders on my way to work. And you think about this, okay, well, you know, ha, 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 very funny, right? Well, <coughs> interesting issues here. So, again, here I have my, my, my withings. It will tell you how many steps I've taken. It will also tell you my pulse. So you know what my baseline is. You know if it's elevated or not. My phone, lovely GPS indicator. GPS location information over time, velocity. My phone's moving 70 miles an hour. My pulse rate's elevated at 7.30 in the morning. Oh, I also stream music through this. While listening to animals as leaders, I'm the guy in the BMW with the high beams on behind you. That's really, really interesting. Now, again, any one of those pieces of information by itself is not that interesting. Taken together, do I have stress issues? Am I at increased risk for diabetes? Am I at increased risk of heart disease because I lead a stressful lifestyle that causes me to drive like a lunatic on Interstate 287 in the morning? And people say, oh, you're just from New Jersey. It's OK. Um, yeah, true, but it's one of the things we worry about. So how is it that we actually add this layer of vernacular to understanding the streams of information we get from your devices, the streams of information we get from your daily activity, and to put it into a more meaningful medical context? And that even depends upon what you're trying to do. So two people, two views of the same fitness tracker, very, very different experiences. One guy is the one who's, you know, my fitness pal, I'm broadcasting my run every single day. There are people on Facebook who just say mute. I'm tired of seeing your run every morning because I went and got coffee and a donut, okay? <laughs> and the other one is like, okay, hey, you know, you are in every risk category for diabetes. Overweight, overage, you know, bad body uh, mass index, high, you know, A1C level. We're going to put you on the diet to help you prevent, you know, developing type 2 diabetes as you, as you grow older. So, again, the question is, they both want to do the same thing. They both want to be healthy. But it, there are different points in that journey. So how is it we capture the appropriate vernacular to help them? One way we do that, I think, is, is to really start thinking through genres. And again, I'm a big believer in genres. Whether you think about this from a natural language processing perspective, think about this from building a word graph, this to me is going to be one of the, the great uses of either machine learning or you know, very, very high-end uses of MapReduce will be to figure out how is it we want to go parse, enrich, or annotate all this unstructured data we get in the medical context. And again, it could be figuring out well, how is it you describe someone who's pre-diabetic? We know how to do it mathematically. You, you're overweight, you're of a certain age category, certain race, certain uh, body mass index, you know, certain uh, blood sugar ratios. But how about proclivity for sugar? How about how often you end up at Dunkin' Donuts? How about how often you eat Pop-Tarts? I'm sorry, Andy, I had to bust you there. Okay, those are interesting things we can go figure out. Again, we might get them from your social media stream. I might get them from your healthcare records. But how do I parse them? And Netflix does an amazingly good job of it. So I, I will argue that there are only two genres for movies. There's, there's movies where there's too much talking and movies where things blow up. Um, Titanic, of course, was the ultimate movie because it was three hours of the first genre and then like an hour of the, of the second genre at the end, okay? But 
Yeah, so, no, actually, there's like, a, you know, there, there's horror, there's sci-fi, there's action adventure, there's documentary, um, there's drama, there's romantic comedy, there's like seven. Well, Netflix will tell you it's probably more like 10,000 because they break them down to a very, very fine grain. And in so doing, they make it much easier f to make recommendations, to tailor what they think you should watch next. That's where House of Cards comes from. A lot of studying of what kinds of genres of political thrillers, drama series people like, and allowed them to go produce something that, that I think it has an amazing audience that was instantly created. So the question becomes, what are the genres of healthcare? How is it I want to take all this data I have and actually figure out what are the buckets I want to place people into? Because they may help me, again, identify pre-disease conditions or think about how diseases present early or look for groups of people I might want to go study from a population perspective. Because, again, I, I want to think about this not just in terms of once the disease has presented, but how does I actually prevent disease? How does I actually understand what all the possible factors are going to be? Being able to parse large quantities of data, millions of patient records that are anonymized, and figure out, again, what are the things that happen to look like these categories is very, very useful. That's my argument about metadata. The other thing we have to worry about, and I again, I think, you know, tied to the fitness trackers, is how much data we get over time. And, and I think people look at this and say, well, you know, for the most part, streaming, streaming media is really, really big and everything else isn't. And I will argue that over the course of a lifetime, <coughs> it sort of evens out. And actually managing things like 70 years of Fitbit data is hard. Think about it. I mean, what's the oldest piece of technology you have? Anybody have a Word 95 document you can open? Yeah, good luck finding a copy of Word 95 that works today. Anything older than that? And so it's really funny. My um, way, way, way back in probably 1986, um, one of the guys at Boston University decided he was going to publish the first ever internet cookbook in the days of Usenet. And um, I submitted one of my mom's recipes to him, and it's still kicking around, and it's wrong, and I can't fix it. It's a text file. Text files live forever. Everything else you have to really worry about. How's the data represented? What are the, the, the metrics we use for it? Again, what's the scale of it? How do we correlate these things? So if you look at something like streaming HD video, you know, four gig an hour roughly, but it's only useful for an hour, okay? Take something like my Nest thermostat, probably 10 kilobytes a day or so coming off of that. You know, it's, it's, you know, every five minutes it sends updates, but they're fairly small updates. Same thing with your Tesla. If you have a Tesla, probably a couple hundred K a day. It's constantly sending telemetry, but over the, again, for a small period of time, it's not that much. My, the Nest is interesting when? Over the course of a season. You know, over the course of the heating season or over the course of the air conditioning season. Your Tesla, over the course of either a, a few full charges and drains or over the course of a, a set of fairly long trips so you understand your driving patterns. You know, maybe even over the course of a few years. But when we start to talk about healthcare data, we're really looking at things that have very, very long life cycles. 60, 70 years, maybe even more. And again, the healthier we get, the better we do it at, um, at predicting disease. I think that number, you know, the, the average lifespan will go up. It means we have even more data to worry about. So if I talk about big data in healthcare, just how big is it? Well, let me assume that I do a really great job parsing all of my, my social media stream, and I'm going to put a couple tags on it. Angry driver, heavy metal listener, over, you know, overachieving coffee drinker. Maybe if I get a couple tags a week over 75 years, it's 100 meg. It's kind of noise. You think about that. I mean, that, that's like a couple of pictures worth of data. My, if I even have a couple of activity trackers, let's say I have three or four of them. Again, assuming I'll have more of them over time. And they're generating, again, a few tens of... of, of kilobytes of data at a time. Maybe that's a gigabyte over the course of a lifetime. My genomic data is 300 gig. But the interesting part, the part of me that differs from the baseline is only about 180 meg. So that's kind of scary. The stuff that makes me me is, is smaller in magnitude than the noise I get off of my fitness trackers. If I take a look at my electronic medical records or electronic health records, they vary from about 10 megabytes and, uh, per year up to about 50 gigabytes a year. It turns out that the, the distribution is very tail heavy. Obviously, as you get older, as more things break, as you end up in a hospital more, you have more images done, again, because things broke, your electronic health record gets a lot bigger. Up to that point, it's fairly small. If you're basically young, healthy, you, know, you don't have any x-rays, you have never broken a bone, your total size of your electronic medical is not all that big. But again, let's assume that it gets fairly large, the images dominate, maybe I can generate two terabytes now life's getting interesting. How about my metabolomic data? This is going to be one of the interesting ones. How is it I can actually test how my body's processing and reacting to certain things? 
I want to understand more. Everybody thinks, okay, well, you sequence the genome, you've got to be done. The genome is like, we now know the language. It's like someone said, okay, here is the blueprint. Here is the, the Java language specification. They say, all right, so go write every possible Java program. Well, no, you just give me the language spec. That's what happened with the genome. We know what the language spec is. We have no idea how the programs work. So whether it's a combination of proteomics, metabolomics, really understanding microbiomics, those are all the things that actually modulate how the genome works. So, you know, we can very easily throw off a, a terabyte of metabolomic data. It's, again, depends upon how good we get at sensing it and collecting it, how fine-grained it is. That's not unheard of. Microbiomic data, your gut bacteria, 300 times the size of the human genome. I just, again, I'll argue, I don't think we really know what's baseline, what's present in an average person, what is average in this case. Probably hugely dependent upon geography, of family history, and so on. Now, again, so maybe the answer is, well, it's up there in the, um, in the, in the multiple terabyte range. But again, maybe the, what we're only interested in here is the difference. Don't know yet, but definitely big in big data. My guess is that if you're well instrumented, and that just sounds like a horrible thing to say, but if you're well instrumented, you'll probably throw off somewhere between five and 10 terabytes per person. It's a lot of data, especially when you have to worry about keeping it for 75 years. Now, IBM says that your lifetime social media footprint is a petabyte. The average person is gonna generate a petabyte of data. Here's the problem with that. That's my petabyte of data, it's concert pictures. Now, you can infer all sorts of interesting things there. I promise you it has nothing to do with my body chemistry or any other kind of chemistry, okay? It's just, it's social. But that's the thing you're fighting against. You know, is there healthcare data there? Probably not. It's really not that interesting. So how do we go back and take a look at this and say, what are the things here that are interesting? How do we actually start to make sense of this over time? And one of the things I think we wanna start looking at is how do we find signals in that data? If it is mostly real time, if we can time correlate it, what's a signal look like? How do we apply things like fast Fourier transfer? So who, you guys use Shazam, Spotify, okay? You know how they work? Go read the papers on how Shazam works. It's awesome stuff. Basically, they look for what they call significant events. If you're a musician, known as downbeats. They find the beginning of a measure. Listen. That allows you to start listening at any point in the song and say, okay, here's a point at which I can actually quantize the music. Generates a, a, a fast Fourier transfer, generates a, a hash signature of that measure. Generates a couple of them, then goes back to the database and tries to find as many as possible that match. That's how it guesses what the song is. You say, well, how is it possible? You can start listening you know, 33 seconds into a song and figures out what it is. It's because it's generating all these, these little fingerprints and then going back and trying to say, what's, the, most, what's the, the largest number that match? Very, very cool stuff. How do we do that for things that are not musical domains? How do we quantize the data? How do we figure out what the matches are that we're looking for? Again, this is how we start to detect patterns. And there are lots of, of interesting applications here. This is a graph that I borrowed showing um, how many times patients were treated for otitis media, ear infections, and the treatment failed because it was the wrong antibiotic or the, 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 the uh, infection had become antibiotic resistant. You start to look at this. First of all, you look at you know, the, the increasing rates of resistance here and go, okay, definitely a problem there with, with ear infections. But you also look at that and say, how would we map those over time for the same patient? How do I start to now build a time versus failure map and if you look at that, let's say you see closer, you look at it and say, you know what? Those are interesting events. There's some time dependence, there's some periodicity to the data that I didn't think I would see before. My favorite example of this that we can now talk about in probably not 15 years ago, um, when I was at Sun Microsystems, we had a series of servers that were failing. We're trying to figure out why were they failing? It turns out we, we could not figure out what the components were that were failing. It was only when someone plotted failures over time and said, look at this. The same part shows a failure after a consistent number of days. Something's wearing out. It turned out what was wearing out was one of the sockets on the motherboard. It was actually, de actually developing a mechanical failure due to the amount of electricity we were pumping through it. But never would have found that. Because otherwise, the things just look like random, they look like random failures. How is it you find periodicity in data that doesn't seem to have any? There very well may be periodicity here, having to do with how frequently you prescribe the same antibiotic. Or do you prescribe it for too short a time or too long a time? which actually increases things like, like resistance in, in the local strains of infection. Highly geographic, again, you know, things like ear infection, like other infections, they tend to, to be fairly geographic in terms of their variation. How is it we go and, and find that kind of, of data in there? And while I start to bring these things together, um, one of my big, big, big concerns is that we have to completely rethink privacy and risk management. 
that privacy is not a one-time thing. It's not something where you sign your HIPAA agreement and say, okay, that's it, I'm, I'm happy with the data. We constantly want to be sensing it. So this is a, a real-world example. Um, if I take an anonymous purchase record, in this case, you, you see a record that buyer one, two, three, four, five, six made a $7 purchase at a skeet shop in West Orange, New Jersey on a certain day. And you then happen to go match that with, well, okay, who was either checking in or tweeting or otherwise from Cody Arena in South Mountain, New Jersey? You say, oh, that's me. I probably had my skate sharpened. Now, maybe it's not me. Maybe it's the other seven people that had their skate sharpened that day. But you know what? You've now identified a cohort of less than 10 people. According to the FDA, that's no longer anonymous. We can track you down. And again, there's been a lot of studies done showing if you have only one or two pieces of correlating information, typically geographic information, so you can place a person in a, a geographical bounding box or in a time bounding box, it's a lot easier to figure out who they are. And again, or to get them narrowed down to a small cohort. This is a huge deal. So as we think about manipulating big data, one of the things I worry about is what should we mix? Or what can't we mix? Or how do we make sure that we are not intruding on someone's privacy by bringing together different data sets, particularly as we want to go build up that non-medical, that vernacular picture of who you are and what you look like as, as a medical individual. So IBM likes to talk about the, the four Vs of big data. You know, it's big, it moves fast, it has a lot of variety, um, and you, you want to test its veracity. Um, I will make a semaphore joke and say it's not V, it's P. It's the other half of the semaphore. Um, what you really want to think about here is your privacy of the data. So who can see it, for what period of time, for what purpose, and you know, combined with what other data. I want to think about its propagation. Where's it going? And I also want to think very much about its provenance. Where did it come from? How do I know it's correct? How, do I, how can I ensure its veracity? And this is, um, if, if you... Uh, Talking to Andy, one of the projects we're sponsoring now, the, the Senior Capstone Project, is looking at uh, using blockchain in, in uh, healthcare cases. So, Bitcoin, blockchain. All right, everybody should go learn about blockchain. Now, again, people talk about Bitcoin, and it's like, ooh, Bitcoin, you know, drug money, dirty. Um, the interesting technology underneath it is blockchain. Blockchain is a public transaction ledger that is secure, cannot be repudiated, as it can't be tampered with. And it's public. And that's how Bitcoin works, is you actually publish the chain of what's happened to every transaction, what's happened to every coin. That way it prevents double spending, it prevents people creating their own. It's a neat way of saying, here's where the money was created, we're going to track where it went, but it's anonymous. It's all tracked with very, very large public keys as opposed to people's names and email addresses. I believe that this gives us a number of things that we need for our healthcare data. Well, the key attraction of something like blockchain is it's decentralized, there's no one owner of it. It's federated, that is the data kind of lives all over the place, um, and it is secure. Think about your healthcare data. It probably lives in at least five, maybe more like 20 different places. You don't want to bring it all together. Believe me, if you bring all the healthcare data together in the world, guess what becomes the best target for hackers? The place where you put all the target data together. You like having it distributed. What I do want, however, is I want it to move appropriately, under my control. I would like to decide how much of my data moves from provider to provider or if my data should be included in a new study. Or if I want to participate, maybe I want to get a couple dollars for use of my data. Because again, 53-year-old guys with unusual body mass index, a normally high hemoglobin who drink way too much coffee, maybe I'm interesting. You know, I'd like to think that I am, but you know, ideally not in a medical textbook kind of way. Uh, but you don't know. Again, we pay people for blood samples. We pay people to participate in studies you know, where we actually want to go collect, you know, again, personal information about them, why is it we don't open that up much more broadly? Well, because it's very, very hard to, to get the privacy, to get the consent now. So this is one way of doing it. Because you actually have to sign a transaction, that's consent. I agree that this transaction can go forward. I agree I'm gonna spend this Bitcoin. It's no different than saying, I agree that I will allow my data, this portion of my data, to go from point A to point B. And I believe that there are a number of very, very cool things we can do looking at privacy, at data diffusion, and at provenance that will really, I think, start to reshape the way that we think about moving data through you know, the very, very large federated ecosystems. So again, we're starting to see this now in uh, trading, in, in clearing and settling. I think we're gonna start to see more and more of it in smart contracts. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing this now around digital assets. So let's say I, I do a digital painting. How do you prove it is that I make 10 copies of it? Well, what's it keep someone creating an 11th? What ensures the provenance of it? How do you know it is one of the original 10? What if you wanna sell it to a friend? How do you do that? It's very, very hard with digital assets. 
So rather than trying to go add DRM to the assets, let's actually go and create a side chain to it. Let's actually go and create a, a, a chain where you can go and track the provenance of the bits. So how do we go faster? Um, this, kind of my, my, this is usually my, my corporate pitch, which is um, we are trained, I think, as computer scientists, depending upon the order in which you take your classes, to think in sets, to think in relational calculus, to think in third normal form. The world is not third normal form. As much as the database centers would like it to be third normal form, it's not. It's graphical. We tend to think about what's related to what, or what are classes of what, or th think in terms of trees. We think in terms of our friend graphs, our social graphs, our word clouds. So definitely thinking in, in terms of the graphical relationship. Second thing is I really believe that we do better when we publish more data. And it seems obvious, right? You know, we publish way more data probably than we should on social media. But in the scientific community, it's harder. How is it we drive this culture of publishing? And you drive publishing by measuring reuse. Again, it's easy in the publishing world, right? You see, you can see what the Amazon bestsellers are. You know exactly what's being reused. It's harder in the scientific world. You want to publish data such that people will find it useful. They'll want to go consume it. They'll want to go create other insights out of it. I believe that there's a tremendous amount of work yet to happen in terms of the big solvers. I think about those constraints, quantum computing, machine learning, very, very deep machine learning, deep Boltzmann machines, deep graph algorithms, very, very large um, indexing engines. They are all yet to throw off great results. And again, I think we're, we're just starting to scratch the surface here, whether it's in quantum or machine learning. Um, I won't go down the path of arguing whether or not we're going to have Skynet created. Um, I'll leave that one for the better computer scientist than me. But I do believe that as we start to think about this volume of data we're dealing with, we have to find better ways of, of adding the appropriate overlays to it. No one wants to go through petabytes of my pictures of Rush and Fish concerts to figure out that I might be at risk for diabetes. It just doesn't add up. You're not, unless I happen to be taking a picture at a restaurant before the show, you're not going to find it there. So let's figure out how we want to really go index the data appropriately. And finally, the more we publish data, historically, when you would have a, an application, an enterprise application running, all the control around the data was built into the application. Now we go and we publish stuff. Where's the access control? It's, it's oh, taken away. So we have to get smarter in thinking, again, this is one of those privacy rights. How is it we wrap data appropriately in an envelope and publish it such it can be used for the intent and the, and the goals that we, that we intended it to be? So I love, um, Klaus Schwab did this great piece about two months ago in uh, Foreign Affairs called The Fourth Industrial Revolution. It's talking about you know, how we're at the verge of another revolution driven by you know, massive you know, uh, production, mass customization, 3D printing, you know, huge network systems, you know, sensors, all this great stuff. And he says, it's going to lead to a supply side miracle. And for the most part, it's a very, very good view of sort of how we've come up to this point and what's possible there. What I will argue is that in healthcare, you're the supply side. It's data that becomes interesting, and the data is highly personal, and it's yours. How is it that we go and create that supply side miracle? I really think it comes down to thinking about what we want to do with big data, how we measure its propagation, how we protect it appropriately, how we drive consent, and how we add clarity to it. I really do believe that we can make that, that miracle of a supply chain happen in healthcare. Um, we just need to think about the problem a little bit better. And you know, of course, the good news is it's the people in this room. It is, I believe, a heavy dose of computer science that will enable that. So to go back to where I started, um, my, I believe my, my future is, in fact, somewhat beautiful. Um, that the more precise the data becomes, the better aggregated it becomes, um, that I will actually have a much better view of everything from my body chemistry to my risk for disease to behavior changes I might need to make in my lifestyle. I will have a very, very highly personalized view of what we call the health states. That is, how are you feeling now? What are you doing about it? What's happening in your body from a systemic point of view? Um, I will be an active participant in healthcare, not just you know, going to the doctor when required or guilted into it, but it's actually something that I have a, a, a nice set of goals around because leads to a much better and hopefully much longer lifestyle. And a lot of times I am very, very willing to share data, so I am not the example in the medical textbook. It's, it's really not something you want to, you know, it's not the kind of publishing you want to, you want to aim toward. On that note, I will say thank you. And questions, comments? I'm getting no credit for the steps I took while I was up here, so I have to. Yeah. <laughs>
So if you have a question, we have a couple of ambassadors. If you'll raise your hand and they'll bring a mic to you. We want to capture the questions on the video. You have a question? You're not allowed to ask a question. Okay. <laughs> so can you tell us about some of the disruptive technologies that Mark is <coughs> work, working on? Sure. Um, give you a view from my group. What we're looking at <coughs> is um, essentially how do we ingest more data and how do we add metadata around it? So we bring in hundreds of data sets a year and they range from population level data to uh, data that we purchase from our research partners about particular studies or about, you know, in some cases, you know, anonymized health records. We want to actually look at disease progression. And um, it's very hard to find what you're looking for. So one of the projects we worked on was something, we originally called it Waffle House, because that was where we got the idea, is looking at the Waffle House. And it's like, wow, this is everything. It's like, wow, that's really what we want to get to for our data. Um, and uh, was later renamed Hydra because it sounds classier than Waffle House, especially dealing with medical data. Uh, but someone described it very well as Pinterest for data sets. It allows people to, to find, comment, tag, annotate, and otherwise build relationships among the data sets. So that was what we did. It was a fairly simple project. The goal was, again, to build a very simple metadata system. We've now plugged that into our Hadoop infrastructure so we can now capture metadata. Our goal now is to add more and more um, automatic parsing of things like tags or genres so we can start to add you know, genre information as we see fit to it and you know, auto-generate taxonomies. <coughs> um, we started to do some work on uh, things like homomorphic encryption and partial homomorphic encryption. How is it we can go operate on healthcare data um, without disclosing it? So you actually can operate on the encrypted data. Some really great research being done in that space. Doing a lot of work thinking about blockchain and how can we build federated secure transports for moving data around with explicit user consent. Um, doing a lot of work. Um, it turns out in quantum there are a couple of, of problems you start to look at that you think of them as, as chemistry being, oh, it's chemistry, you know, it's, it's, it's synthesis, it's, it's manufacturing, how hard could it be? It's, it's really hard. You know, manufacturing in particular is nasty because you worry about um, byproducts, temperature, time, quality, yield, number of steps. You know, all those things affect your cost and your ability to produce a drug. When people talk about, well, we, you know, there's only a certain number of, of doses of a particular drug available in the market, well, we'll make more. Well, they go, it's, like, it's not like you can just wave the magic wand and they suddenly appear. Some of these things take, take quite a long time to produce. So as we think through the uh, synthesis part of chemistry, I think you'll find that there's a lot of you know, really, really interesting, very, very large graph problems to go look at. So we're starting to look, take a look at some of those and, and how we might solve them very, very differently. Um, again, I, I'll, I'll say publicly that we're, uh, we're poking around a little bit in some quantum spaces. Um, it's one of those things I think that, that it's a killer solution looking for a really interesting problem and we may have found one or two that are interesting enough to go run through it. We'll go, we'll go play with that a little bit. Um, and finally, starting to think about privacy, privacy and rights management. Because again, I, I, it's one of the things that, that I worry about tremendously. It's um, because it, 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 it tends to be binary, right? You're doing fine, then you have a, a major privacy event, and all of a sudden you're not doing fine anymore. And it, it's, you know, if you, if you look at the ethics of our company, it's about, you know, saving and improving lives, it's about respect for the patient. Um, and it's about, the, about the respecting the rights of the patient way up there. You can't get that wrong. And again, it's, it's cool to talk about how much data we have and, and all, the, all the things we do with big data, but if we do the wrong thing once even, that's, that's a bad answer. So really starting to take a look at, at how we might better manage our privacy, how we might better manage um, all the implications to privacy and, and couple with that as consent. Because you know, a lot of times people are willing to, if they're getting something in return, you know, why do you recycle? Recycling basically on the surface of it is, it does not make sense. You take time and effort to put things in a bin that you normally could just throw away, hoping that, well, you do it because it's good and because it reduces cost, it's good for the environment. Okay, there's delayed gratification there. Well, again, we never think about delayed gratification in healthcare. And, and that, you know, I think that we're looking at different ways of actually capturing what that means over long periods of time. Other questions? I guess I have two questions. Uh, in 2008, uh, under uh, President Obama, the Reinvestment Act mm -hmm. had a provision uh, called High Tech, which you probably know about. Mm -hmm. uh, under High Tech, there was a ruling 45 CFR which uh, designated the conduit. And this provided that uh, 
patients that, uh, excuse me, data on patients in the, continua in the continuum of care um, don't need to go through a HIPAA process. Uh, what's surprising to me is I haven't seen a wide variety of uh, conduit methods, or as you described as one of the four type, uh, four disruptive fields of innovation as transportation, as a result of this deregulation of the transportation of um, diagnostic information between care providers. So that's the first part of the question, which has to do with value-based care, because data is moving between care providers. The second part is, and I got to work on a research project with McKesson um, to build software for to help doctors make decisions. And how are how are you guys using um, information about the continuation of care to improve value and help doctors uh, make decisions? So. Um, I, I will not profess to be a, a policy expert. I mean, I, I think a lot of the parts of Afo ACA, the Affordable Care Act, get into meaningful use as how is it you can use data to meaningfully improve the quality of health care. And over time, you know, a lot of it stipulated the increased use of electronic medical records um, to be able to receive reimbursement. And then what will come out after that then is going to be um, thinking about uh, how is it we actually go and drive quality of care or standards of care. That's you're actually starting to look at outcomes. And, and, you t and you basically treat an outcome as the end result as opposed to completing a transaction or completing a service transaction. So a lot of the, the details in there are meant to, I would say, um, really focus on how you go and, and, and drive data through the system for that. I can't comment specifically on, on, uh, on the conduit piece. Uh, in terms of what we're doing, uh, historically I think you would think of a pharmaceutical company as making therapies, you know, pills and vaccines, very narrow. If you think about now the, the data continuum we live in, there's an awful lot of data we get before the therapy. Again, we understand what, what you're at risk for, what your metabolism might be like, or again, what your behavior might be like, which would suggest a treatment plan. Then there's a lot of data afterwards in terms of adherence, in terms of compliance, in terms of effect, in terms of patient reported outcomes. Is it working? How do you feel? Is it making an improvement? Increasingly, we're finding that, that as a healthcare company, we need to play along that entire continuum. So one of the things we did is we created a separate division uh, called Healthcare Services and Solutions. In the, in the U.S. and other countries, um, you can't go and, and convey um, software. You can't go and give something of value to, a, to your customer who's also responsible for influencing or prescribing your medicine. It's a conflict of interest. And you know, it's a very, very solid regulation. I think it's, it has shown a very bright light on where value is created and where value is received in the healthcare system. So one of the things we've done is we have a separate part of the company that does that. They are independent, right? They can go sell that solution to, you know, other pharmaceutical companies if they want to. We we'll start to look then at um, how to do things like weight management, how to do things like improving quality of care. Uh, we also have a venture fund, so companies like Wiser Together, where it's essentially crowdsourcing for one of those eigenvectors of cost, personal cost, social cost, uh, time cost, financial cost, um, pain cost and to allow people to start comparing notes aggressively there. So that it, it's a mix of things. It's our venture fund that, that takes a look at a, a variety of points along that spectrum. It's the healthcare services solutions. Um, and then it's investments we're making in a lot of times in, in working in market where we want to go provide, uh, you know, basically software solutions for our customers. And again, we do that very, very carefully because it is a heavily regulated environment. But increasingly, I think you'll, si you'll find that it's not just the science is not just chemistry and biology. Increasingly, it's, a lot of it is becoming computer science, becoming data-driven as well. And again, I think with, with more sensors, with finer grain diagnostics, um, with, with improved real-time diagnostics, that's only going to increase. Hi, I'm a chemical engineer, so I know a lot about <laughs> the making of medicine and mm -hmm. how expensive that is and kind of seeing like where they try to cut costs to make each pill one cent cheaper. So I was wondering at companies like Merck, do you know like roughly how much is being invested in research towards data management or security versus the research that's going into the other products? And in general, in industry, do you think that an appropriate amount of money and resources are currently being directed towards privacy and data management? Okay, so there's like three questions in there. The first is around cost, of basically cost of manufacture. Uh, and or more like cost of data in reference to cost of manufacturing research. 
Well, so um, I think that there, I mean, certainly every company, you know, thinks a lot about privacy, thinks a lot about privacy of, of, of medical records that we make it that are anonymized, um, thinks an awful lot about um, how we, basically how we show up in the market. Uh, with, um, with increased digitization of therapies, whether it's, you know, the, the, um, the smart, uh, you know, uh, inhalers that, that send a, a text message every time you press them, or connect via USB you know, or, or Bluetooth every time you press them, through to smart packaging. You can tell when the blister pack's been opened. Uh, you can tell when um, even things like Proteus, you know, smart sensors, to things that Google Health is working on. Um, I think we're going we're to be essentially needing to look very, very carefully at uh, where the data is acquired, where is it we decide that it's going to have a, a, essentially a privacy enclave, and how much further we want it to go. This is one of the reasons why the, um, you know, the, the um, Apple has encrypted everything, and you know basically why you can't back up your data on your phone unless it's encrypted because it has all your healthcare data in it now. So I think there's an increased emphasis on it. I, it's very, very much so. I mean, this is um, certainly one of the things we look at when we have a, 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 our IT risk management and security group, which includes the chief information security officer for the company, basically has a major influence on how the company thinks about risk, and that that risk is you know everything from regulatory risk to to political risk to uh, you know. To again, you know, very, very, you know, uh, things like, like, you know, our risk in, in managing the portfolio. So IT, is, IT, and and therefore the uh, technological risk of information shows up there as, as a key part of it. Um, you know, are people investing enough? I mean, it's, this is uh, the good news is that we can leverage everything that happens in the market. We can leverage everything that's going on in the security space, or in the privacy space, in the risk detection space. But I think that you, you never want to think of having, you know, an answer. So, oh, that's it. We're done. We're safe now. It's constantly this, this risk management and, uh, and sensing the market and understanding what's going on, what the new threat vectors are. And that's you know, an awful lot of work goes into that. To your first question about, about cost of manufacture, it's definitely something we look at. You know, I think it's something that every company looks at. And, and um, again, there are lots of vectors to it, right? Because you may say, oh, well, we found a, a way of doing this more cheaply. Okay, but it adds three synthesis steps. So maybe the, maybe the, the individual starting points are, are less expensive, but it, it takes us longer, or it requires more steps, and, and there, therefore more work in the in the manufacturing plant. Oh, so well, okay. Well, it produces this, um, you know, produces nitrous oxide, which you have to be able to bleed off. So it actually adds to the manufacturing cost that way. So there's, you know, no free lunch there, which is good. It becomes a very, very interesting problem to go look at. A very interesting graph problem to go look at. Other questions. Hey. Uh, so from a health care uh, perspective, um, I understand, you know, there's all these very uh, numerous sources of data to get. How do you reconcile the needs of the logistical needs of, you know, your analytics to automate this with uh, establishing, you know, the human relationships with these partners? Like, you know, maybe you want to go to Tesla, maybe you want to go to Fitbit. Um, <coughs> how would you, you know, reconcile those very two different worlds? A lot. <clears throat> Again, a lot of that happens through the healthcare services and solutions bit, and we, Merck is not in the um, medical device business per se, right? So interesting enough, as we start to look at things like um, fast diagnostics, uh, fitness trackers, or anything else that might be what I call the, in the data collection space, we tend to look at them as partners. They're, they're throwing off data, then we want to say, how will we run that data through HIPAA compliance, privacy compliance, basically how do you on-ramp it and what can we go do with it? Um, you know, I've yet to, you know, we, um, I've yet to see anybody come back and say, oh, we're going to go sell you Fitbit down, you know, again, you can go and, and a lot of it has to be done under individual control. So you may have, you know, there are a fair number of, of fitness apps where you'll go and you'll aggregate data from, again, your multiple trackers together. You'll keep it with a food diary, for example, but that's all done under the individual control. It's really not up to the to the the uh, pharmaceutical companies or the healthcare companies to go aggregate it that way. Uh, I do think that again, this is one of those. Um, if we get better at consent and get better at provenance, I believe there are opportunities there to, to do data sharing on a very very large scale. Um, and I think from a from a research perspective, there's real value in that. But it, again, you have to know where your data is going. You have to know where it's going and why. You have to be able to say no, I don't want to do that, and to revoke consent. Uh, again, I think there's some very cool mechanisms um, 
if it's all paper or you know before paper you know or after paper tape you know that was hard now if if everything's transmitted you know whether it's you know through blockchain or something equivalent it's easy enough to revoke consent toss the keys you throw away consent but yeah we have to think you know it's the good news is the mechanisms are starting to float the hard work now is making sure we apply them appropriately <coughs> Last question. It's not I have one. Okay. <laughs> Better be an easy one, though. So much easier than these very eloquently worded and, and complex questions. My wife works for Allscripts, which is um, electronic mm -hmm. health care records. And mm -hmm. I remember she was so excited five years ago when she got this job. She came home and she was explaining to me this utopia that we were going to find ourselves in so that when. I go to my personal care physician, I'm not going to have to fill out those forms over and over and over because that data is there. And then when I go to a specialist, they're going to have access to that, so I'm not going to have to fill out these forms. And when I go on vacation and I get hurt and I have to go to the emergency room, I'm going to have a card and it's going to have all my medical records on it. They're going to scan it. And five years later, that's not the world that we live in. So I'm just curious from somebody who's kind of in this, this uh, you know, broader industry of healthcare, what are the challenges, what are the roadblocks, and, and what's it going to take for us to finally get to this world of utopia? Well, so a lot of this was predicated on things like Blue Button. So Blue Button's initiative said, okay, you are allowed to download your medical records. So think about it. Do you want to walk around with a, a USB stick around your neck with all your medical records on it? It's just like, you know, forget about a security risk. It's just, it's, it's just not... You know, it, it's just not a great mode of operation. What you really want to say is, <coughs> my internist referred me to, you know, this orthopedist. Please have all my records over there. I don't want to have to go fill out the same, you know, survey again. Just transmit it all over there. And that's what you want is the ability to send appropriate but partial information from provider to provider under your consent or under your doctor's consent. Well, you know, how do they speak the same? You know, how are they on the same transport? How are they on the same, you know, encoding system? There's a lot of work to get done there. It's not just, okay, I can give you everything in blue button format. Because I could, I could download everything and take it over and say, here, they're going to look at it and go, we're using a different EMR. I don't know what to go do with that. You know, we're, I'm using a different standard. We don't know what to go do with that. So I think the, the, the sea change that I saw was if you look at a lot of enterprise software, let's say from the early, late 80s, early 90s, all database driven, all SQL driven, a lot of it built on Oracle and Informix and Sybase at the time. And the data was essentially locked up. Every one of them had a different schema, had a, a, a different set of, of application rules, different sets of business logic. And then along came the web, in particular HTTP. And HTTP did um, two things. First of all, it didn't really care what the back end looked like as long as you could get data in and out through the web server. The other thing is it didn't really care how it was encoded. That as long as you could represent things as, a, as an HTML or as an HTTP payload, whether it was JSON or XML or HTML, you didn't care. And the back end could change. You could change the size of the payload. You could change your web page, and you didn't have to go rewrite all the front end applications. We haven't quite gotten there yet in terms of figuring out what the equivalent to HTTP and web servers are. But I think, I feel like we're getting closer to finding out what's the right web server for interchange of healthcare data. And again, it's, it's harder because, again, think about the first, you know, um, the air change was like, oh, look, you know, I can have a website. You know, Hi, my name is Hal. I like to bully in disco music, to quote Guy Steele. And like, okay, you didn't really worry about the security of that. Now you do. So I, I worry about the security and the providence of the transports there. So, you know, much harder problems, but, you know, I also think that the, the mechanics are there. Thank and you and if, it was, if it was solved, we'd have a job. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, look, that's, you know, for anybody here who's a junior or senior, like, go solve this, right? Uh, you know, take a fresh set of eyes on the problem and say, why is it we've been doing things the way we've been doing them? Maybe there's a better way of, of moving data around. Maybe there's a different way of thinking about privacy. Because everyone likes to talk about, you know, oh, the millennials don't really worry about privacy. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. You know, you do when it's your healthcare data. You have to do when it's your private data. You have to do when it's something that's potentially embarrassing. And think about, for a lot of times, healthcare is, among other things, not just something that's on you, it's embarrassing a lot of times. You don't want to have that data shared publicly. So we have the opportunity to actually go turn it into something very, very positive. Uh, I think it requires thinking about the problem differently. Well, I just want to say thank you, and please beat Duke repeatedly and, and, and religiously <laughs> beat Duke. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.